When we talk about union avoidance, we're talking about employee relations and labor relations. One of the things we talk often about is the common mistakes that management teams and supervisory teams make before, during, and after union campaigns. These mistakes are costly. These mistakes lead to dips in morale, they lead to decreased productivity, and they can hurt an organization financially. But these mistakes are also the very platform that the unions are going to use to gain traction in the union campaign. Today I'm joined by Ricardo Torres, the President and CEO of Permanent Solutions Labor Consultants. Ricardo is a former high-level union official with plenty of experience in using these mistakes against management. Today, Ricardo is working with management teams throughout the country, assisting them in maintaining their union-free status. I'm also joined today by two Littler Mendelssohn attorneys, Jeff Harrison and Dale Deichler, out of the Minneapolis, Minnesota office. Jeff is with us here in Detroit in our studio today, and Dale is joining us via telephone from his office in Minneapolis. Today, we're going to dissect these mistakes and really give a clear picture of the ramifications of some of these mistakes, and more importantly, provide a blueprint uh, for our audience uh, so that they have a clear understanding of what they need to do to be proactive in uh, ensuring up their positive employee relations platform within their organization. Because really, when it comes down to union avoidance, that's all it is. Good employee relations, good management, good supervisors, people that actually care about the people that work for them and know how to show it while at the same time getting the most out of productivity, that's the easiest way to define union avoidance. My name is Bob Carroll. I'm the Executive Vice President of Permanent Solutions Labor Consultants. I'm your host today, and this is PS Labor Talk. We often talk to clients who state they don't want to invest in proactive labor relations and union awareness training because it's difficult to show an immediate return on their investment. Talk to me a bit about employers who are a penny wise and a pound foolish. Jeff? Well, I think you see a a wide range of approaches to this. You see employers who assess their condition on an annual or even semi-annual basis. You see employers who, frankly, wait till a petition is filed and nothing else is going to trigger assistance from a union avoidance perspective. And um, from my perspective, I don't care what the industry is, the proactive approach works. It it is difficult to measure, and that's part of the problem. The money you're saved, because the best union campaign is the one you that never sprung up, so you never knew about it. I I think that just one example is short training. If one supervisor picks up an early sign of warning activity, and that could be from a two-hour session of training, that could stop a campaign in its tracks right there. You know, Jeff, I, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. One of the things that that that, that happens, and, and now we have a you know a 42 you know average 42 day election cycle, and it's going to get a lot harder if uh, we go to a shortened election cycle. But what what happens is that it, you know we do a lot of campaigns with with management. What happens is that those things that people realize that they that that have been happening after a campaign has started. They don't realize what union activity is. They don't realize or, or aren't sensitive to how unions operate. You know, majority of times when we get a call from a company saying that we got a petition signed, a lot of times they're surprised that they got the petition. And when we ask them, well, you, you had no idea that there was any union activity, they said, no, absolutely not. We had no, no idea. But two or three weeks down the road, as their their supervisors are more educated, they're more aware of what union tactics are. They say, "Yeah, you know what? Now that I think about it, there were a lot of issues that um, that we could have spotted, that we should have spotted, and we didn't because we just didn't know." Yeah, I think that a, lo- a good union avoidance tool certainly stops a union campaign. But from a business justification side for those efforts, I mean, a good union's avoidance program brings up problems in all, all forms of, of the workforce. It could be a policy issue, a physical working condition issue. It could be a, a one particular supervisor who's mistreating employees. And a, a good employer knows about those issues and knows the details, can address them. And certainly there's a benefit to an accident that doesn't happen or a, uh, an agency fu- uh, complaint that's filed. Other than There's a benefit to the cost other than just avoiding a union drive. Well, it, 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 and it's just good business. It's just you know good business practices. It's really good business when you focus on 
you know, I think it's an understatement when you when you mention Pennywise. Um, you know, to put together a basic two-hour program like Jeff's talking about is, you know, maybe a couple of thousand dollars, maybe more, maybe even less, depending on what the employer wants. But when you compare that and the basic message of just getting information up to top management so that people aren't blindsided versus, you know, the labor costs over a, you know, decades-old relationship, plus, you know, I would just add in there that, that, that some of the unhidden costs are, are the enormous time and expense that uh, our clients have to put into the things like bargaining, just the time of, that, that goes into bargaining or preparing for an arbitration and not counting fees. So I, I, I really would stress penny wise because, you know, you're really only talking about a few thousand dollars compared to as, as I think uh, someone said hundreds over the long term. Isn't it true that a uh, union campaign has ramifications uh, when it comes to dollars and cents that go beyond consulting, uh, lawyer fees, you know, talking about morale, talking about productivity, turnover during campaigns. Isn't that true as well? I think that's right. Eh? If a facility goes union, it obviously could set a standard that could move and bleed into other facilities within that employer or simply result in inflexibility and your cost could go up, depending on the industry, 25 30%. Or, and that's maybe even without something like a strike happening. One of the, um, it's, it's spot on, one of, one of the, you know, one-on-one um, organizing strategies and, and working on the on, with unions for years and having over a thousand organizing campaigns under my belt. One one on one organizing is when you get into a facility, to get into a company. The first thing you're doing is looking at um, subsidiaries or other facilities that they have open. And and I think that it, 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 I think that it's hard to calculate the damage that happens because one of the the you know the the strategy for unions is to get under the table and to do its damage. How a union wins an organizing campaign is get in there, getting in there and destroying the relationship between management and the and the employees. That's that's just the way that they went. Nobody's gonna vote for a union if they're happy with management. So their job one on one is to get in there and destroy the relationship with management and that can last for years. Who it, it's very hard to calculate the long term damage that those activities can cause. I think sometimes you see smaller employers more hesitant to spend money up front and that results in a, unfortunately a penny wise pound foolish approach because it's those employers with few people on the site who are actually at times or generally the most vulnerable to union organizing and those those employers need to identify their issues as quickly as possible. Well, and someone mentioned spillover into other facilities. Spillover into other facilities if you know, if you've got a Teamsters contract and you've got the National Warehousing uh, Division mandating things like, you know, standards on productivity and when there's a dispute, they bring in their Teamsters industrial engineer. It, it really can have nationwide implications if it, uh, or ramifications if a client's got multiple facilities. Absolutely. Spot on. You know, in fact, one of the things that I used to used to direct my uh, my organizing teams across the country to do is to look in to all of the people that we have contracts with, all the companies that we have contracts with, and do investigation and to find out what subsidiaries or other facilities that they have so we could, you know, we could uh, direct organizing activity at those other facilities also. The, it's easiest once you have a, uh, a foothold in, in a company. So even if, it's, even if it's a small company that has 20 or 30 employees, um, this is a foothold into other companies, and I think you mentioned, Jeff, that um, a lot of companies with smaller a smaller employee base, maybe 20 or 30 uh, employees, are more reluctant to, um, to fight union organizing activities, well, and, and try to do it on their own, um, without counsel or without uh, outside consultants. And one of the things I want to say is that the hardest campaigns to win, the hardest organizing campaigns to win are ones with the fewer employees. In fact, if you look at statistics, you'll see that most of the union organizing wins are from smaller facilities. And I think on that point, an employer with 50 employees may feel that it would maybe cost less than if they were had, say, 500 employees to run a campaign. And that may be true to some extent, but it certain wouldn't be, well, certainly wouldn't be, at least in my experience, 10% of the cost. A lot, once you get that campaign apparatus up and running, 
the on-site presence, to dealing with the NLRB. A lot of those costs are fixed no matter what the unit size. Can I talk a little bit about buy-in real quick? Um, A lot of times when we deal with a a client, one of the things that we notice is um, within their infrastructure, some of the executive management management team in there have philosophical differences uh, regarding the strategy and tactics they want to use to take on the union or if they want to take on the union. Uh, Since we're putting this to dollars and cents, isn't this something that they should start thinking about before a petition? Critical, Bob. I think that... um, Those first days after a petition uh, are critical, and that's not the time to get your philosophy aligned within the company. Some employers have uh, international decision makers, and that um, complicates things as well when you're trying to determine a course of action. So I encourage uh, companies of any size to address this and figure out what is the philosophy you want to take to it. It, Will it be aggressive union avoidance tactic? Is everybody on board? Because what you want to avoid is in the post-petition days, talking about it and burning valuable campaign time trying to figure out figure out frankly how you want to campaign you know i uh i agree with you i think that um that it's, it's important to have a union policy before you ever get a petition before you ever get a um a uh you know petition or you before you have union activity before you have the union knocking on your door you have to understand what your game strategy is going to be i i think that it, it is uh prudent for companies to have to understand that they are a target that uh this this uh, that getting the petition could could happen easily happen to them, and ha- having those those issues sorted out prior to a union filing a petition against you is the time to work these things out. Absolutely, Dale. Can I direct a question to you? Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about uh, policies. Uh, one of the things that that I think shocks a lot of people when we're talking to them is that even the biggest, most reputable companies have policies in their handbooks that uh, are outdated or flat-out illegal, if you will. Isn't this a current focus with the National Labor Relations Board? And isn't this something that unions use to their advantage while organizing workers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the conundrum or problem for uh, employers in these situations is you can do, you know, you can do everything right uh, in an organizing campaign. You can even win the election. Uh, but we've had clients, we've got a, an ongoing dispute right now where client won the election by a two-to-one margin and um, had a number of policies, including its no-solicitation policy, overturned. And it was on, on the policy basis alone that that a second election is getting directed. Um, and it's such a simple thing to do in terms of, you know, for legal review and correction if necessary, you don't want to give unions the gimme, you know, that um, you know, if they don't like the way things are going in a campaign, they file a charge, and the first thing that the government asks for is a copy of the policies so that they can find some kind of a technical violation that will affect the organizing. So it's it's really too bad. I mean, and you said that some of the most reputable companies, it's, it's you know, high, low, and in between uh You've got folks that are not paying the, the kind of attention they need to be uh, on, on something that is just a technical compliance issue. Yeah, D- Dale, I, I completely agree. I think that it's really a cruel, cruel result when you have a campaign where the employees don't really care what a solicitation policy says. They probably don't read it. Neither does management. It's dull reading, written by lawyers, right? But then it becomes into focus after your win, and it's too late. It's it's just too late. It's It's very sad. Uh, and then the test, of course, isn't whether people read it or understood it, or even whether the employer tried to enforce it against an employee during the campaign. The test is whether it's sitting there in your handbook. And that should really send chills up the spine of employers because it's it's such a small tweak and um, never ceases to amaze me. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's pretty high of employers out there who carry with them an overbroad solicitation policy, which is illegal. We had, we had witnesses at the trial on this thing who testified that they'd never read it. They had no idea what the, what the rules were. And you're right. It's strict liability. If you don't have the right language, you're, you know, you're out of luck. Right, right. But, you know, Dell, you know who reads it every time? Is one of the first things that we used to ask for, and I had my organizing teams across the country the first day that they met with workers, and it usually was just with a few workers, even you know on some of the largest campaigns we it started out meeting with two or three workers, 
and the first thing that we used to ask for is give me your handbook give me your policies and we used to go through that you know with a fine tooth comb and look at every possible thing the 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 the, the secret to on the union side winning in the campaign is having all these contingency these contingencies worked out before the uh, organizing campaign even really starts what is what is what are our options what are the weaknesses one of the things that we used to look at it when we used to go into a company is whether the, before we made the decision to either we're going to uh, you know take up the cause and, and help these workers organize or not was our ability to see the weaknesses within the structure of that company and if if when, if, when looking at the uh, the handbook and looking at the policies and looking at the relationships we could see that there was a disconnect and a weakness between the the workers and especially the frontline supervisors that was one of the big uh, uh, factors that we that we used to decide whether we were going to attack a company or not so the the very one of the very bases of organizing was to look at those policies in that handbook Jeff, I know me and you uh, spoke about an uh, off-duty access policy. Uh, can you tell our audience what that is and why you think that's so important and how it relates to union avoidance? Sure. I think that um, it's off, oftentimes an employee who has access to the facility, of course, wants to take advantage of that access to facility to help organize the organizing effort. So often you see a real pro-union uh, advocate lingering after work, being in different areas of the facility, things that are different, and the, and the question is, well, how does the employer want to respond to that? It is legal to have a policy restricting employee access to the interior of a site as long as it's communicated to the employees and enforced consistently. Uh, but there's a rub, right? I mean, one, you have to have a legal policy and decide up front that you want to have this for, for other reasons other than union organizing, but you also have to enforce it. And this is an area where um, you see employers that really don't. It's one of those uh, policies that's on the books but isn't enforced. And people, of course, are lingering there to do everything from the Sudoku puzzle to wait for their ride to whatever else. And that practice could undermine your ability to enforce a good no-access policy once organizing hits. Rick, let me ask you, as a former union official, you've done your share of organizing. Wouldn't you agree with me when I say that if you have a policy, it's worth enforcing it? And if you're not enforcing it, what's it good for in that book? Well, I mean, I mean... It, it, Practically, you know, on a practical basis, it's worth nothing, and a legal basis, it's worth nothing if you're not consistently enforcing uh, uh, rules and regulations. And I will go on to say that it is the job of the union, and that's one of the reasons why they stand the ground. Um, and, and it's the goal. The, the perfect organizing campaign is when the first time a company realizes that they've been um, that they have activities when they get a petition, and it happens a lot more than than than, than a lot of companies think. Um, but the, the job of the union organizer is to get in there and whether there's policies or not is to break them or is to find an excuse to, to weaken them. But, but they will do everything they can, that they can to break them. And, and as Jeff just said, you have to have you know, consistently enforced policies that you don't bend for any reason. And that's one, of the things that, that's one of the things that we used to look at, once again, prior to us making the decision to uh, to undertake a union organizing campaign or not. Yeah, one of the things I've seen employers successfully do in preparing their team to uh, battle a union campaign is provide supervisors with basic training on scenarios. Um, rather than just showing them a solicitation policy and another handbook policy like no access and saying go out there and enforce it, boil those uh, handbook words down to scenarios they might see in real life. What do you do if you see a non-employee in the interior of the building? What do you do if you see an off-duty employee in the interior of the building? You know, just they're all a manageable number of scenarios so your supervisors can identify red flags and in those initial moments not not break the law, frankly. You know, as far as strategically speaking also, Jeff, is, is, is what you said is excellent because you can have, have a set of policies and, and, and people just take comfort while well, we have policies in place. But once again, when I was on the other side, well, we used to strategize as about how to circumvent those policies, how to weaken those policies, how to hide, uh, you know, our, our, the union activity from management. So you, it's got to be active. It's, it's got to be, you know, supervisors, especially frontline supervisors, have to have an understanding of what union organizing tactics are so they understand what to look for. And, and, and 
what what I always you know tell management is that even the smallest piece of the puzzle have got to be filtered up to someone who has a mile high view of all activity within the facility, so they can say, "Wow, this we're starting to see a picture." We're, you know, but it's got to come from understanding organizing tactics that unions are utilizing. Isn't there some uh, businesses that uh, have real open access where these these access policies would be difficult to enforce, such as? Uh, hospitals, restaurants, uh, retail stores. Uh, is there anything that can be done with them, and, and do they use that, do unions use that to their advantage? Jeff? Absolutely to both questions, Bob. I think that it's not a, quite as easy in those settings that are open to the public as your uh, widget manufacturing plant that has a fence around it, and because that has a more manageable set of rules of how to handle union organizing activity. But in those types of businesses you just mentioned, um, the public has uh, access to the interior, and you may find your union organizing brought inside the gates. Right? There may be no gates, and uh, just more reasons, more complexity to handling those scenarios. And I think the frontline supervision, in particular, deserves rules. They they will want guidance, basic and a basic understanding of how to deal uh, with people inside the, the building. The, the rules do vary a bit. I mean, I guess in a retail setting, I would I would point out just as a tweak to the no solicitation that you, you can prohibit solicitation at all times by employees on selling floors. There's special rules rules for health care. Um, and, and Jeff's exactly right. The, you know, they have the right to come into a store, unions do, and use the store for its intended purpose, that is the shop. Um, they, they don't have the right to walk down the aisle uh, and talk to someone who's stocking a shelf about signing a union card. And these things, too, these situations, you might have to communicate with patients, patients, families, people shopping in your store. Again, some additional complexity there where your frontline supervision, they're going to want a simple answer. Should I tell them to take that button off in the ICU if they wear it? Should I remove this person from our lobby? And we've got to, at some point, provide the guidance as employers, I think. Well, one, and, and once again, you know, it, it, it's understanding unions' activities. And, and I will, and there was a point where I put together the, um, the uh, steel workers and the California uh, Hospital Associations merged together. And we used to, you know, do a lot of organizing in, uh, in healthcare and hospitals in California and across the country. And um, once again, it's very hard to regulate. It's very hard because it's open, open, open places, it's open cafeterias. You know, they, you get in there and you have people with inside the hospitals working with the unions and getting them information and then actually using the hospital workers to organize with inside. We did a large, in fact, the largest hospital in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles County. We, one of the first hospitals we did once we put the, the merge together with the uh, California Nurses Hospital Association um, or the California Nurses Association. We... Um, we had a campaign where the California Nurses Association was, they had two elections. Uh, the second one that they won. In that time, we were going after all the other units and organizing them. And by the time uh, we were getting ready to, to file a petition, we had over 300 internal organizers in that hospital. Now, we called them internal organizers, but the hospital management called them nurses because they were working with us hand in hand to help organize the facilities. So un once again, understanding what the union's tactics are are, are essential uh, in retail. When I was a, uh, a strike director, we used to when you know one of my last strikes um, with the Teamsters was in Detroit, at the Detroit newspaper um, uh, strike, and one of the ways then where a lot of people used to affect stores, uh, supermarkets, all retail. Um, to, to try to persuade them not to advertise within those newspapers was to actually go in there and do damage within the stores uh, uh, acting as customers and it was very hard for management to be able to realize you know the to you know to separate whose customers or who who are not who's in there trying to do damage to the store so it's they're they're they're, they're vulnerable um, uh, uh, companies out there and once again it's, it's, it's important to understand what unions can do the weaknesses um, and uh, and how to try to protect themselves from it and once again I believe that the strongest way to protect themselves from union activity is through education 
Yeah, especially with those types of facilities, you might even have to interact within your company with uh, media relations people or public relations. And it's, it's again, more complicated than just simply saying uh, non-employees off the site and then it just enforce your, your solicitation policy. You know, it, it's very it's very complicated. Uh, we also, you know, I also help put together the uh, the Canadian retail workers together with the uh, with the with the steel workers in Canada. Um, one of the one of the, you know one of the once again going back to, to how how unions organize is to and you said it, it, it as you said Jeff it can be very complicated. They have to hire um, uh, different outside companies to. To uh, to uh, promote them within the media and public relations companies and consultants and, and and attorneys, so it gets very expensive, and that's the whole point. One of the one of the easiest ways to organize, and it, we're, we're going to see it happening more and more, I believe, is 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 that unions are going to try to organize the companies and not so much the workers. And if they can do so much damage to the companies, to where it's just cost them the money, it's cost them in public relations, a lot of them are going to give in and say, listen. Let's you know let, we'll recognize you or we'll have a car check or you know and that's what the unions want. But the whole point behind that is hurting them to the point to where they have to make a decision: either we stay in business, we stay profitable, or we have a union. Dale, how important is it to have a plan in place, a proactive plan for handling union organizing? No, you have to have a plan in place. It's, it, 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 there's. There's no if, and, or but about having a plan in place because you don't want, you know, the first notice of, of you know, union organizing to be the flyer and then no one, you know, it, it, two weeks go by and nothing get, and nothing happens. Um, we, we've had clients, we've helped clients prepare very robust, Jeff is familiar with this, campaigns in a box where everything from start to finish is in place and ready to go at the first sign of any union organizing, including in some of those kinds of uh, products, what we would do is have a specific plan for the first 48 hours. And, you know, this rapid response team is going to get called. And, you know, this is the first communication, you know, tailored to the situation that we're going to make. Because unions come into these uh, situations uh, they usually have much more than a majority of cards signed, and they've got all of the momentum. And your goal in the next 42-plus days is to take that momentum back. But the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you've got a carved in stone and ready to roll out an administer plan. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, what some employers may not realize is the extent of the negativity that goes into filing a campaign and how much momentum there is. I mean, Rick, I'm sure you would advise your people, you don't file a campaign at the lowest moment of support, it'd be the highest, right? Well, when I was on the union side, I would advise my people. <laughs> well, so, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, that is what I meant. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. In fact, in fact, in fact, a lot of time goes behind it. A lot of people take, a lot of companies will take comfort and and it's false comfort saying that well the organizing petitions have gone down over the last 10 years and i i I would like to surmise that the reason is not because the activity is lower we know there's less um uh there's less amount of uh, petitions that are being filed but what unions are doing now is that as as dale said they're following with you know 65 to 70 percent of the support within within the facility, and they're no longer. It's very rare that you see a, a union found with thirty percent of the employees signing cards. You know, it's, it's, they they want to get a strong majority. They want to get the support to make sure that they can um, to to help ensure that they're going to actually get a win. And I think it's good for an employer to have a post petition plan in place. Go to the campaign to box. I mean, it'll still be a fluid situation, and there'll be plenty of decisions to make on the fly. But you have your core strategy, philosophy and communication materials pre-planned that everybody's bought off on so there's no delays because uh, sometimes the slowest thing to get out is not a speech or anything else the shortest letters sometimes everybody has to buy into it's better to get that up front and so you can uh, launch the campaign as needed but i would also suggest having a campaign in a box maybe a smaller one for a card campaign it doesn't have a petition but same thing you know how you're going to what initiatives you'll take and at what pace to stop it before it gets to a petition and you know jeff what i i would i would suggest also you know strongly suggest also is that even if so, even if a company has a campaign in the in the box you know uh strategy 
they also need to be able to educate the people on exactly what they're talking about. It's not, I mean, you can't win a campaign with just giving them a flyer. I mean, you, you got to have the material. You, you, you're way above, uh, ahead of the, the eight ball if you have a, a you know, I'll use your term, a campaign in the box ready for them. That's a great idea. But they also have to understand exactly what they're handing out because what what's going to happen is when you start communicating with people, is that they ask questions and you and, and if you say and, and, if, and if you lose them in the beginning you say well we're, we're not sure we don't know about that or, or you give them the wrong information then they're going to be turned off even more also no identifying who your um communicators your good communicators are once once again is that when you have an organizing campaign the union has spent a lot of time and energy into into isolating your supervisors, especially your frontline supervisors, and getting uh, getting a uh, discontentment between the workers and the frontline supervisors. So you have to find out who are the good uh, communicators, who can get in there, who have who what what supervisors have a good relation, and it doesn't even have to be a frontline supervisor, but someone in management that has a good relationship with the people, who's been there, who's been consistent with them, and those are those. And it's important that they are the the message. Uh, senders and not someone who may have abused the workers in the past. So understanding who your workforce is, is is extremely important also. Yeah, I agree. I think that in a campaign, most campaigns, it's the speeches and flyers and upper management messages that supplement the real messages, and that's what's happening between the employees and the frontline supervision rather than the other way around. And without, without guidance, there, it's very unlikely, I'd say almost impossible, for a team of frontline supervisors to legally and effectively carry the ball in the campaign. They will need training. And a, and a good a good training ses- session not only gives them the legal parameters, it also can assess, to Rick's point, which one of them are going to be able to communicate um, well in their precinct within but the facility. Isn't it true that the training for the supervisors uh, takes you know, repetition, takes some time, I mean, would you say it should be an annual? At least. I think it would be unnatural. If a frontline supervisor is too good at this, it's probably you know, strange. No, of course, most people will have to hear it a few times, and uh, it becomes natural at that point. Well, you know, you know also, the, the biggest cause of, of union organizing campaigns, and, I, you know, and, and from working on the other side and working with management now since 2001, you know I mean? I've been through a lot of campaigns. The biggest cause of union organizing campaigns is the breakdown of communications. And that's the biggest cause. That's what that's what happens. And and um, once again, understanding is, is, is that's why it's so important to have a ongoing, uh, flowing strategy as far as how how you educate your your uh, your supervisors, especially frontline supervisors, because it, especially it, and if you go to a company that that has no clue on that there was union organizing activity happening, well then what's that say about the communication between? Management and the workers. It says that it's pretty bad. Um, the union is now in the first in the first year when supervisors are just getting their feet wet on some of this, some of these issues. You might even want to look at quarterly, just for the first year, so it almost becomes second nature. Absolutely, Dale. Absolutely, it's because you know one of the things is that, and you have to understand that there's always a a a, a, a countermeasure also. And, and if, if you have a union that the organizing department is doing a good job. What they're going to do is educate their workers, or especially the, their internal organizing committee, exactly what's going to happen, and then then they're going to exploit it. If um, if say for instance that there's there, there's bad communication, as soon as they get a petition, all of a sudden oh, everybody's on the floor talking to them. People who were rude or who could care less um, about their workers are now on the floor patting them on the back and asking them about their kids. Well, that's unnatural. The union is going to utilize this by saying, "See how how much good we're doing already. We haven't even we don't even officially represent you, and we're not even negotiating a contract for you yet. We haven't won yet. We're going to, but we haven't won yet. And look at the change that's the positive change that's happened already. So understanding that everything you do is going to have a counter effect also, and that's why it's so important to understand what the other side is doing too, because you're not you're not working." In, in, in a box. You know, the other side is actively trying to counter everything that you're trying to accomplish, and their goal is to damage you. So understanding both those sides helps you put together a better strategy as far as when you communicate with your employees. Yeah, one other thing employers might want to consider, uh, annual training is great or even semi-annual, but they should also have a plan in place to 
educate new supervisors because that might not happen on January 1st when someone transfers over to we're all of a sudden responsible legally for what comes out of that person's mouth when they're addressing employees and so I would encourage employers to make labor awareness training a component of new supervisor training. Hey, hey Dell, Dell, would you agree with me and this is one of the things that's been a, a pet peeve of mine is that whenever they promote supervisors whether it be you know frontline supervisors or, or upper management they look at all their qualities and the qualities that hey they can, they know how to manufacture a widget they know how to push it through they know how to get it through shipping and out to the customer on time but how much and, 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 and the question is how much attention do they put on what kind of communicators these people are what kind of problem solvers are these people what you know how do they, they relate with their with people who they uh, who you know who work below them and, um, and, and, and I would surmise that it's very little. And, and, and I think that's, that's, that's the core of the problem. These campaigns are won or lost at the end of the day on the shoulders of the, of the frontline supervisors. I'm sure all of us have stories about, you, know, you talk about, Jeff talks about hiring or maybe transitioning someone. You mentioned a promotion. And, and one of the key causes we've seen to you know, successful union organizing drives is You've got a change in management that, that brings along with it someone who is not a problem solver, someone who takes questions but doesn't follow up and make sure they get answered or that there's some kind of a resolution to whatever the concern is. Or they're just, you know, they're jerks. That problem spills over into, the, into any actual campaign because, of course, as the employer, you're relying on them for the most genuine information you can get. And believe me, those kinds of non-problem solving supervisors aren't getting any genuine information. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that book, Good to Great, getting the right people on the bus and making sure they know, you know, how to treat people properly and, and uh, use some common sense. And some of those supervisors, those new ones, end up in a place like a night shift of an operation where there might not be as much uh, mid and upper level management oversight. And so problems kind of fester from that, yep. that new supervisor. With or if it's a remote location, we had we had a campaign where um, there was there were there was a store out in California, and there and, and to the point about small campaigns, it was difficult. But you know, four employees plus a on-site store manager, and there was virtually no oversight. You know, a couple things that employers, if they're looking for a checklist of ways to reduce their vulnerability, I'd add one. Um, Look at your operation, see where there's an absence of supervisors, because we're talking about supervisors maybe who aren't good supervisors, but often I think campaign support happens where there's that supervisor who leaves the company, and you know maybe it's not so important to replace that person for a while, and people go leaderless for a while, and I think that presents a big vulnerability. And the other thing I'd add is, do this? does the employer even know who is a supervisor? Because often a petition hits, and one of the first items, this is for an employer who didn't have a advanced plan is you have to figure out who who's really on your on your side legally and, and you know it's, it's kind of funny i think you know first of all you're not you're never going to lose an organized campaign because you have too many good supervisors on the floor and i think that what happens when when as you just mentioned jeff when there is is a lack of supervision on the floor it's not that people are wondering you know where is supervision or i think that they get into a competition and I'm talking about the workers on the floor who is going to take that supervisor's place. So, and it becomes very dangerous when you when you have a, a unofficial leaders on the floor who all the other workers rally around for their for their information and for um the to, to answer questions that they have. You know, un, unofficial uh, uh uh leadership on the floor is one of the biggest things that that that, that, that one of the hardest things that to break or to correct when there is union organizing activity because you know one of the first things i say to management you know on the union side they have to take control of the floor that's what we used to tell them you have to take control of the floor you have to own the floor working with management one of the first things i say is we have to take back the floor you know we have to we have to control what is happening out in the facility and when you have you know long term unofficial you know, leaders on the floor taking control of their co-workers, it's hard to do. Most of our clients think that their frontline supervisory team is going to be involved in the campaign. 
Isn't it true that not every supervisor has what it takes to be in a campaign? And when when is the best time to start deciding what supervisors will be strong and which ones could hinder a campaign? As soon as possible. I think that, as we talked about a few minutes ago, in most operations, the frontline supervision is going to win it or lose it for the employer. And an employer can actually assess the supervisor through everything from an employee survey, where employees comment on their frontline leadership, to a training session where it's very interactive and at the end of the day you should know which people philosophically are with the company's union free position, which people communicate well with their employees or even know much about their employees. And if you know that, you can form a, a battle plan ahead of time. Maybe you train that supervisor up to get them up to where they need to be. Maybe you bring in a different supervisor to that area or you assign other resources somehow so you don't just lose that entire group of employees over to the union side, because that's where the cards get signed. It's it's poor supervision equals where the cards signed. It's it's not rocket science. And, and I think determining who's a good supervisor is, is, is it has to be fluid. It has to be an ongoing process. When I worked on the other side, many frontline supervisors, and, and that's why every campaign is different. You 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 can't get stagnated and say, well, we're gonna this we're gonna do A, then we're gonna do B, then we're gonna do C, because every campaign is different. If you look at a lot of facilities, and we'll look at the uh, demographics of, of, of the workforce. We'll look at the history of the workforce. We'll look at, well, are, are these workers, do they basically come, you know, from this area? They grew up in this area. Um, they've known each other, you know, for years. They've known their supervisors for years. They played Little League Baseball with them. Well, when, when, when you have those situations, it's, it's influencing the frontline supervisors to support the union activities is a lot easier to do. It's a lot stronger. It's one of the things that we used to look at when I was back on the union side. We would look at every aspect of who the employees are that are trying to organize, and we would pick out strategies on exactly how to get as much influence as possible. If we could get a lot of frontline supervisors to support the organizing drive, and there's many ways to do it, and it's a lot easier than you think, than many people might think, um, it is going to make the organizing uh, uh, the possibility of winning the organizing campaign a, a lot better. Yeah, often I think you see frontline supervision giving a half-hearted support to the company's campaign effort, kind of saying, "Well, the company says this or that." With training and education of supervisors, they should get to the point where, in their hearts, they believe it's not good for the company or even good for the employees themselves. Even if they don't believe it, you 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 have the ability to flush them out, and and management, especially frontline management, has to be dedicated to 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 management and the cause and and, and having a good uh, uh, work team on on the on the floor. It's very important that there's a good consistent um, uh, uh, back and forth with management in in the workforce, and if you see that there are supervisors who are not supporting management and would be dangerous in an organizing campaign, then you have to you have to flush them out because they're not leaders. You know, one thing I don't we haven't talked much about is maybe a total vulnerability assessment that looks at the employee opinions during quiet times. And legally it gets very complicated to do that once union activity starts, certainly if a petition's filed. And so just encourage employee employers to craft something that could be a combination of a survey, live discussions with round tables of employees, a variety of different ways, but it never ceases to amaze me how small some of these issues are on the surface that lead to a petition. I'll just give you a couple examples where, well, just it's, it's the one supervisor that, as Dale said, uh, you said, was being a jerk to his employees. And another one was that a supervisor had totally disregarded the guys who wanted to uh, go to firearm season when hunting season opened. Boom, there was a petition just based on that. And the uh, and, if the employer picks up on these things, it's a big deal to the to the employee, um, and it's enough to drive card signing. Many of these issues, it's not just wages. Isn't it true though that uh, a lot of times the employer doesn't recognize this in their supervisors because of their own pride, because pride um, leads them to believe that they have the best team in town. How do they get around that pride? I know you talked about the surveys, which I think is a great idea, but what's the danger in that, and how do they get around that? Well, there is a danger in a, in a big company, I think, that uh, the site, individual sites will be hesitant to admit that there's a problem. And pe you have a kind of a fiefdom where the, the leaders there might even believe there's no problem because of pride, but certainly want to cover it up. And if that happens, if the root cause isn't corrected and identified, then it's going to grow, issues grow into organizing issues. So 
best thing to do is get a method in there, some sort of recurring system for early identification of issues. It's like a medical condition. The earlier you find it, it's the it's the brush and floss instead of the tooth extraction. I mean, it, it's it's a, if it festers, you're going to get a problem. I, I think I think what Bob was just saying is, is is one of the core problems is because when you go in there and and if there's an activity, everybody wants to protect their turf. First of all, nobody wants to admit, yeah, there's activity, but it's in the other department. It's in the other guy's shit. It's not on mine. Um, and nobody, I think it's human nature that that we don't want to look at. We don't want to look at problems. We want to mask it over. It's like you hear a knock in your car and you turn the radio up a little higher so you don't have to, oh, okay, I'm <laughs> at peace of mind right now. But, you know, that's not a long-term fix. Um, I think that uh, I think that that's why you 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 have to have fluid training. You have to evaluate and reevaluate your team at all times. I think staying, staying union free is, is this. You have to make staying union free part of your corporate DNA, which means that you have to look intensely look at yourself all the time and not just take the word of, of people to, um, to, to disclose activity that may or may not be happening within their own department. Dale, earlier you brought up a, a rapid response team. Can you let our audience know what a rapid response team is? why it's a benefit, and also why not having that team in place could be detrimental. Uh, absolutely. It, uh, I mean, it, a rapid res- response team is uh, the folks that you want immediately ready to, to jump in and direct on-site management as to what the next steps will be. And it, it really needs to be kind of a, an all-star team, if you will, consisting of utility players, such as, you know, you want asset protection or security involved. You're obviously, if you've got a labor relations or HR function, there's got to be representative from there. Uh, I would suggest, you know, whatever the title is, the COO or the CEO uh, uh, probably doesn't need to be on that team but should be briefed. Depends on the operation. But you want people, you know, one representative from each key operational area within the organization that is knowledgeable about what the uh, you know what the next steps are going to be and 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 to to the point of not pulling these things off the shelf and planning out a very carefully tailored uh, response and campaign. I think getting the right team in place is more important for the first ten days of a campaign than any messages even to the employees. If you had to choose, it's that critical to figure out who is going to be in front of the employees, who's going to be willing to devote a lot of their time. Uh, at that site, if it's an off-site situation, uh, sometimes even who shouldn't be there, um, and that's those might be some tough internal discussions. And it's good to get those up front because again, the clock is ticking once you get union activity. And if you know who's dedicated, trained, informed, all stars, as Dale said, and they're going to be immediately put on site, uh, that's a great recipe to win. You take the politics out of it. You're not concerned about hurting someone's feelings who who may not be a, commun- a good communicator. Someone as Jeff just mentioned, should not be there. You're coming with a fresh set of eyes. You're looking at it at the situation as 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 someone who is not who is not on a day to day basis has been influenced by the people that you know where the organizing activity has taken place. That is that's essential. And, and the question is, well, how do you know who's a good communicator or who's not? Well, that's one of the things that the decision makers who come in on the A team, um, on the All Star team, as Dale put it will be able to recognize and and to evaluate quickly and, and I and I think you're 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 right on Jeff when you say that the first few days is essential because if you make a mistake in that time you're not gonna be able to correct it. In a week and sometimes it's easier for outsiders to advise on this than internal because sometimes there's a deference to somebody who's three levels up in management and say, Well we need to get John involved but John won't be here for three days. That's three campaign days lost. When we, you can have those candid discussions up front to avoid that problem. We've all done campaigns where people were prepared, and we've done campaigns where there was no preparation done. They got the petition, and that's the first they ever heard of a union, right? Let's paint a picture of how important the first week is, how much uh, chaos, basically, is involved with getting through a first week where there's no planning done. Because you only got 42 days, right? Right now, you only got 42 days. Uh, paint a picture of that first week, and if nothing's prepared or if they are prepared, what's the difference? Union activity hits, and one of the mid-level supervisors going up to employee and saying, hey, everybody, those machines are on wheels, and 
they're on wheels for reasons, fellas. I hope you're brushing up on your Spanish. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he was implying pretty strongly that that facility was going to move out of the country. So before anybody even assists that employer, you've already committed uh, objectionable conduct. Or we already talked about the example of bad policies. You could have lost the campaign without preparation. Now, on the flip side, it's a beautiful thing when um, everything works in harmony and you have a trained, dedicated supervisor who picks up on activity, reports it promptly. People who are going to assist in the response are notified on site as needed. A great kickoff speech. I've seen that stop a lot of card signing campaigns. It's a very effective thing to look people in the eyes and say, uh, and, and that often prevents a petition and with the cost savings there. It's incredible. Um, so I think it, it, not just winning or losing your vote, it may prevent a vote. There's a lot of things that we look at in that first week, the different challenges that they have to overcome. One of the challenges that we've met uh, recently uh, that I'd like to discuss is a multilingual workforce and, and dealing with a multilingual workforce. Uh, well, that's something that I would say falls right in line with preparing beforehand. Uh, because it's amazing how many challenges fall just in line with dealing with your multilingual workforce. Well, let me let me say something real quick first, and 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 and, and you're right, Bob. Multilingual, and I don't know, Dale, how many campaigns you've had to deal with where there's different different languages. But one of the first things, and I think that it even is even more important than than if you're dealing with a multilingual uh, uh, work, um, you know, uh, work facility. Is that you have to understand? And this is one of the one of the, the things that you know it, it's so important that people really have a grasp of, of what they're doing when they go in there and talk, and why it's so important to have a dedicated team that will go in there. Is because you have to understand, you have to prepare that you're dealing with people who don't like you and don't trust you, and if you get it wrong in the first week or the first ten days, you may never get them back. Because once again, you have to understand that you're dealing with the majority of people. And if it's true, the form where unions are more and more waiting until they get 65 to 70% of the people to sign cards before they file a petition, you're dealing with the majority of people who don't like you, who don't trust you, and they got to that point because they, their problems haven't been solved to this point. I think most times when the petitions filed, the union would win if the vote was held that day, certainly. And at some point it's turned around in that 42 days, um, but it just isn't going to be turned around quickly if you have a language barrier. The greater the barrier, the longer it will take. And pre-planning, I mean, some workforces I've seen where the employer literally has nobody on the floor who can communicate with the employees in, in their native tongue. And you, it's critical to prepare uh, written materials, because if you don't, What's going to happen is there's going to be one leader maybe who's the most fluent in English or uh, some de facto leaders will pop up and they will communicate then to their people who speak their language well. And so, and you better hope they're on your side if, if that's the case. Dell, have you had much uh, much experience with this? You know, to making sure that, you know, the key communications are, are in translation. But again, that would be something to look at beforehand. In fact, uh, one of the things that uh, Rick and I have seen, and I'm sure, uh, Jeff, you and Dale have seen it, are businesses that don't have their policies and procedures in the language, uh, don't do their write-ups in the language. Now, this is before the union activity happens, but, Rick, uh, what kind of damage does that do if the policies or the write-ups aren't done in the native language? It's, tre it's tremendous, and a lot of times the damage is... I mean, once again, if you have a smart union organizing team that's on the other side... And remember, already, the unions are winning the majority of campaigns. A lot of people are surprised when you, when you let them know that they're winning the majority of the campaigns because... They're just looking at, well, the numbers are going down. They must be losing almost every campaign. Well, they're not. They're winning the majority of them. But once again, it comes to knowing who your people are. And to knowing, and, 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 and we had a campaign where there was nine different languages. And, and you know, and, and we have a lot of, lot of campaigns where there's different languages. You know, and Spanish is, is the majority of those campaigns, but many other languages also. And it's like anything else, it's knowing who your people are. Many times we'll go through a campaign, or before um, we actually get on the ground, we'll ask questions about the workforce. Okay, well, okay, they, they, the majority of them speak a different language. Well, are they, uh, do they have an understanding? What is the understanding that they have in English? And the supervisors almost every time say, well, great, there's really no language issue. It's just that they prefer to speak a different language. Well, once you get on the ground, you find that that's not true. Once again, it comes down to they, they don't really know their, their employees. 
and they have a basic under a lot of times they have a basic understanding of what the language is of what English is, but they don't have a a real uh, extensive knowledge of the language, so it, so it makes it really hard to communicate with them. And a lot of times, which even makes it worse, is that what they would do is they would take somebody out on the shop floor without educating them, without making sure that they're good communicators or they're good supervision people, and just put them in a, in a, in a position of supervision just because they speak English and the language that a majority of the workers speak on the floor. So they're throwing someone out there. They have no idea. They're happy because they can communicate, and that's that's all that matters. Once again, they could be the worst um, person to put out on the floor as a supervisor because they may be damaging um, the the relationship between management and the workers a lot worse. So just having someone who speaks the language is not the answer. Once again, it comes down to where you have to do the hard work to really know who your people are and understand what their issues are. And I think we've been talking about the reactive side of... of multi-language campaigns. There's on the proactive side, too, it'd be great if employers look to surveys or vulnerability assessments that address the employees in their own language to, to uncover what's the strengths and weaknesses of the facilities are, so you know where you are. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, 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 it's, it, 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 and it's, it's a common problem where a lot of times management will not take into um, consideration that people from other countries have other other, um, uh, you know, conceptions than we do. Um, you know, uh, uh, customs, they have other understandings, they have other emotions than we do here in this country. So when they come in here, a lot of times we're insulting to them because of just, you know, because they have a different custom. You know, the way that they live, the way that they work, they have a different custom on how you talk to them. And it may not even be, be, be talking rude, but it just may, may be the tone of your voice. But there's so many different things that, that, that I think a lot of times that management doesn't really take an understanding on, on, on who that they're, um, who that they're, uh, they're, they're hiring. And, and I'll give you an example. Is, is a lot of times we'll have a, a facility to where people come from Central America, South America, Mexico, um, and, and, and even uh, you know, Americans of Latin, Latin descent who they will think that everybody's the same, that their customs are the same, that, that you know, their, their language is the same, that, you know, that, that they're the same people because they're all Latinos. And it's the furthest from the truth. And a lot of times, you know, you, you know people get insulted by, you know, by, by how management communicates with them. And, and once again, it, 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 and a lot of times, you know, us as Americans might say, well, that's no big deal, they're there to work. But to them, it's a big deal, and it makes the world a difference when you have an organizing campaign, or when you when you're talking about productivity, or when you're talking about your turnover rate. Well, these things really cost money, cost management money, you know, right right up front. We've been talking about um, being proactive and having strategies in place and planning, and I think it's really important to talk about uh, the quickie election uh, because right now it seems that employers count on a 42 day. Uh, election process uh, to give them time, but it, it may very well be that, that that won't be around in the future, correct? Uh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. that's correct. And I think that whether it's a conscious decision or not, a lot of employers wait till you get that union organizer in the outside the gates or you get a petition, and then the first phone call is made to get some uh, advice. And we got um, a lot of calls from employers who were very worried about the NLRB poster, the mandatory poster that was going to have to go up. And now that is not mandatory at this point, but that put out a lot of fear when I thought that was a lot less important and still do than a quickie election because I've been a part of a lot of campaigns where I was very happy the vote wasn't taken on day 15, for instance. I think a lot of yes votes would have come out of that box. But you see it changes over the course of those weeks and uh, and the winds come and, and just have less time to turn around now. It's critical. This is... Um, I can't think of too many things to be bigger than this. Dale, let me ask you, do you think the quickie elections will come? No, I don't. I, uh, you know, they lost once on those, and I, I just don't see it surviving. You know, they went through formal rulemaking when they could have done advisory rulemaking. And formal rulemaking, uh, I just don't see if they, if they do it right, which is one of the things they did wrong. They do it right with the appropriate amount of public input and comment. I, you know, I think that the outcome of that is going to be, you know, the existing system. 
You know, I, just to the flip side, I think that the administration would like to deliver something to labor, and if this doesn't have to be done through the legislation, through legislation, um, I'm a pessimist. I think that uh, this is a very real fear, and would be terrible for an employer who has a union-free um, philosophy. To me, it's a real fear from from this perspective. Nothing prevents any region from exercising the discretion to have an election in a shorter amount of time. Yeah, you know, oh. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Dale. I, I was just agreeing with you. You're absolutely correct. Or to do things like push for mail ballots or other things that are just anti-employer. Well, we're seeing that more often. We're, yep. seeing, we're seeing mail ballots. So I've, I've had a couple campaigns, you know, with management over the last couple of years to where there was no reason to have mail ballots, but they had mail ballots, and it's a lot harder for management to win a mail, ba- you know, with mail ballots. And, and I think that... The danger of, uh, and, I, and I speak with management groups all over the country, and, and I think that the, what scares me for them the most is that so many are ignorant of basic union knowledge and, and, and what, you know, union tactics. And I think that a lot of times what management finds itself doing, once again, as we talked about before, is putting their proverbial head in the sand and saying, okay, well, um, when we when we get nervous about something, then we'll do something about it. And uh, until that point, then we're not going to do anything. And I think we uh, and that was clear to us when we when we thought that the quickie elections was imminent and it was going to happen at any time. We were getting calls from management. Listen, we got to get ahead of the eight ball. We got to start uh, taking you know um, uh, uh, talking to our supervisors. We got to start putting things in plan. And as soon as that went on the back on the back burner, well, so did their plans. So I think that um, once again. There was a saying that we used to have when I worked with the unions is that is that our biggest our biggest friend is unprepared management and I think that um, I think that that unfortunately too many um, too many companies um, don't don't feel that it's in their best uh, interest or that it's or that it's important enough to start um, taking the, the basic steps the basic steps to prevent union organizing activity and. In, in, in I was listening to what you were saying earlier, Jeff. I mean, the the point of it is, is that unions are always looking at how to to to, to organize your facilities, how to you know once again the strategy is about doing damage to it. They're not sleeping at night. They're always looking at new ways that they can get in there and they're trying to change their strategies and become more fluid. And um, I think that um, and and the reasons aren't big. I you know. Big reasons that you know that that everybody can look at. One of the things that we that we used to do when I was on the other side was talk to workers and find out what their individual issues were, and it had to be personal issues before we even decided to take the campaign. It had to be about people felt personally um, slighted, they felt personally assaulted, they felt angry, and and things that happened to them on a personal on a personal level. It didn't have to be these big huge issues, but it was something that we could tap into, almost like a, a emotional pressure point. And get them to you know to to vote yes for the union to become active in the union or uh, organizing activity because of those things. One of my largest organizing uh, wins was a um, a a company in Puerto Rico where there was over six thousand workers and one of the one of the the top organizing people who really was active right from day one was a gentleman who uh, when asked well what was the the reason that brought him to want to organize. Uh, his facility said that you know what I, he felt personally insulted because the um, management couldn't even keep the the bathroom supplied or clean, and he personally was offended by that. They didn't even have enough respect to do the basics um, for them and and have uh, have toilet paper or keep the restrooms clean, and that fueled his anger for many many other stuff. So identifying those things was so was something that we did successfully on the other side and I think that it's important for management to do those same things when they're trying to have a consistent positive approach when they're dealing with the the workforce and, and those long low hanging fruit issues they need to take care of but once again if if you stick your head in the sand you never come to the point of of understanding exactly what issues are or even if there are issues until you have to send an A team in there and then you're behind the eight ball. And I think it's very helpful if an employer can look their employees in the eye, if you ever have card signing, and say, we've heard you, we've dealt with things in the past. Because if an employee, one of the things a union, of course, sells, and a lot of their flyers, for instance, use the word voice. 
you, they're selling a voice for the employees. And if the employer can point to a lot of different ways that they get the employee's voice in a recurring way, that's very helpful and it's more sincere than when uh, someone's trying to get hear them during a campaign. Um, I think there's just no question that that would be a benefit. We're almost out of time. Dale, just real quick, I'd like to ask you for any parting words you'd have for our audience. Um, any bit of advice for managers out there, executive teams out there looking to prepare um, their strategies for union avoidance? Well, I, I think you, you, you have to expect the unexpected and, and not get caught flat-footed. I mean, uh, you know, unions are at less than 7% of the, the, the workforce in the private sector. However, that, that, that it is far from any kind of message that they're, that they're laying down and not trying new tactics. Anything from, and, and we all know this, websites, Twitter accounts, social media. Um, a lot of the work I'm doing these days involves support from non-union. Um, I, I think it's, as a parting word, I think this is significant that the AFL-CIO is now incorporated into their ranks what have been referred to as union front organizations or worker opportunity centers. So they're not... <laughs> You know, they're continuing to, to move forward on a sort of under-the-radar basis through those kinds of organizations. And just because the numbers have diminished doesn't mean that they aren't uh, uh, as aggressive as they've always been in trying to get get the foot in the door. And Jeff? Yeah, I would just encourage employers to really make union avoidance part of their ongoing plan, not just when they're trying to put out a fire when something bad happens. A few years ago, everybody probably remembers the great scare of the Employee Free Choice Act, which was going to change union organizing so dramatically. And a lot of employers at that time instituted proactive measures that they didn't have before. And now, of course, the Employee Free Choice Act died. But I, from what I'm seeing from those employers, the surveys, the management training, the better communication, the issue identification that came from those efforts are still paying off. Rick? I, I think the I think the most important thing, and and, I, and, and everything Dale said is, is and, and Jeff said is spot on. But I think that that, that even coming down to the core of, of what causes uh, union activity, I think that that management, especially frontline supervisors, but I just think it's so important that they actually care about the people, that they actually respect them, and and, and of course they it's got to be a two way street. But if you're going to take the position of being a supervisor, and that's what your career goal is. And one of the, one of the things that that's that's essential to you being a good leader is to have empathy for the people that work for you, and with that's something that you can't fake. And you have to really care about these people. They're human beings, and everybody deserves to be respected who does a good job. And 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 if someone's not doing a good job, there's a way to process them out. But I I just think that the days of yelling and, and disrespectful um, uh, attitudes on the floor are are way gone. Have empathy for your people, and that's gonna that's gonna prevent a lot of the problems right there. Top down, it's gotta be part of your corporate DNA. Not just when times are good, it's gotta be when times are tough. It's even more important to have that professionalism. Rick, Jeff, and Dale, we're out of time. I think we looked at a lot of mistakes uh, during this podcast that other people have made, and I think you would all agree that it's our hope that uh, this is out there for uh, people that want to learn from it. Um, with that said, Rick, uh, Jeff, Dale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. So we just talked about a lot of mistakes. These are real-world mistakes. These are mistakes that management teams and supervisory teams are making all over the world. And really what it comes down to is being proactive. Take the time now. Develop a plan. Like I said in the introduction to this podcast, union avoidance really comes down to having good supervisors in place and practicing positive employee relations. I'm Bob Carroll. I'll see you next time on P.S. Labor Talk.